Hello, everyone, and welcome to really our first ever Black History Month Student Athlete Alumni Forum. We've gathered together a great panel of former Gettysburg student athletes that are going to talk about their experiences on the football field, on the basketball court, and wherever else they roamed on the Gettysburg College campus. So before we get started with everything, I really want to say a big thank you to some groups on campus that kind of helped put this together. First off, my sincere thanks to Devin McKinney. Devin, it works with Musselman Library, and he has spoken to four of the members of our panel for the oral history series the library has been putting together. And he really connected all the dots here. I asked, on, I asked him about some events and projects having to do with Black History Month, and he gave me some absolutely wonderful resources to utilize the biggest of which is our esteemed panel of student athletes here. So I also wanna say thank you to the coaches for spreading, spreading the word to the student athletes. I wanna thank the DEI committee that has been working so hard behind the scenes on social reform on campus and other issues. And of course, our alumni. So I don't wanna to waste too much time because I know our student athletes have some questions that they wanna ask the alumni. And just so you all know, we have five, six, maybe seven student athletes with prearranged questions that they are gonna ask the, the alumni. If you have any additional questions, I would ask that you please put those in the chat and we will try to get to those at the end of this presentation. Also, if you're not talking, try to keep yourself on mute just so we can have the, the speaker front and center talking, either asking the question or answering the question too. We hope this is an open forum where we have a nice exchange of information and ideas. And, you know, hopefully it's Gettysburg great in the end as well. So without further ado, I wanna introduce our alums and I'm gonna each introduce each alum by the year they graduated from Gettysburg and give them the floor, allow them a few minutes to talk about their career in athletics as well as their career after Gettysburg as well. And I wanna start things off with Perry Clark, who is class of 1974, he played basketball at Gettysburg under Bob Holton. He was a double figure scorer, averaged over 11 and a half points per game in his career. And keep in mind student athletes that at that point in time, varsity athletes didn't play their freshman year. They only played three years right. of varsity athletics. So Perry, right. Kirby and Mike Ayers only played three years on the varsity team technically until that rule was abolished, I think in the late seventies or early eighties. Right. So right. Right. in three years, Perry Clark did what most student athletes do in four. And that's all I'll say about him. He can go into more detail. Coach Clark, the floor is yours. Well, first of all, I just want to let you know, I deeply appreciate you and the folks there at Gettysburg having this. And uh, it means an awful lot to me to be a part of this because Gettysburg certainly was a very integral part in my development uh, as a young man and allowed me a springboard to do other things. From there, I wound up going back to DeMatha High School in Washington, DC and coached there under the great Morgan Wooten. From there, I went to Penn State and, and spent four years. So I know the state of Pennsylvania extremely well. Uh, I went to, from there to Georgia Tech, where I, we had a lot of success in my six years there. We wound up being preseason ranked number one in the country. Uh, ultimately, went to a Final Four. I left there and went to Tulane in New Orleans to build a program there. And I was there for about 15 years living to Katrina. I coached there for uh, 11 years. And uh, we had a lot of success there, um, got some awards, went to the NCAA tournament. And from there, I went to the University of Miami, uh, had a lot of success there before going into radio, television, and, and, and some politics and did that. Came back and went to Tech, Tech Stand M Corpus, was a head coach there for four years. I just can't keep a job. That's the problem. <laughs> and, then, and, and then from there, I went back in the radio and television and then wound up at the University of South Carolina, where we've had success here up until this year. I stepped aside. And now I'm presently working with some men. Uh, something I'm going to say is that for the student athletes, use 
the experience was tough. It was difficult culturally. Gettysburg has always, even back in the 70s, tried to bring diversity. They brought a lot of us from different backgrounds. Some were more prepared than others for, for, for the campus life and uh, what they found there. But we all found a common bond and supported each other and helped each other. Mm -hmm. and, and us growing, we made the university better and the university made us better because it prepared us for life. And it allowed us to have a foothold to walk out and understand. See, diversity is basically understanding people that have a different background than, than you do. And being able to work with them, um, coexist with them, communicate with them. And that's what Gettysburg was able to do even back in the 70s when I was there. So I appreciate being there. And I'm going to get off because Mike Ayers is really long-winded and he's going to take most of the time. <laughs> Coach Clark, oh. thank you very much. I'm sure the student athletes have some questions about you. I know there's a couple about your transition to collegiate coaching as well. Yeah, that's pretty cool. But now we'll hand things off to Michael Clark, former football player for the Bullets, led the team in rushing his final two years at a Gettysburg class of 1975. And Mike, since Perry says you're long-winded, I'll just let you take the floor now. Well, thank you, Perry. And absolutely, uh, unlike Coach Clark, I had one job after I left Gettysburg College. <laughs> I, uh, I interned uh, during my J term at uh, Verizon, which is Bella, Pennsylvania was mm -hmm. hired on their management team and spent my 35 year career in telecommunications part of the management team. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, Perry said, I really enjoyed my years at Gettysburg College, prepared me well for the real world. Uh, on campus, uh, there were you know very few African-Americans, uh, but we had a good bond. I had a good relationship with the, with the fraternities, SAE and Teak, and I enjoyed my time there. Uh, had some experiences, uh, just little things uh, as far as being the, like the only African-American in the class and those kind of mm. things, but nothing that would say that I did not enjoy my experience. So uh, I think uh, when I think about diversity and my uh, career uh, at the Gettysburg, it certainly is learning how to accept people for what they are, understand their experiences and what they bring to the table. Uh, certainly teamwork always count. So uh, you understand you give a little, take a little, and for the better of the team. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, but again, I thank the college for doing this. And I look forward to talking with the uh, undergrads. <laughs> thank you, Mike. Appreciate that. And of course, we'll, we'll follow up with your successor in the backfield, Kirby Scott, who of course followed you <laughs> as well, the starting tailback. <laughs> In 1970. He pushed me a little. <laughs> and Kirby, I know you won't talk about yourself, so I'll say it for you. Kirby came through, set all the rushing records, had finished his career with just a shade under 1,900 yards rushing. He was an All-American in not one, but two sports. Got small college, AP, small college All-America in football in 1976, and then went out for the track team in 1977, was an All-American as a member of the 4x1 relay. So wow. one of the few two-sport All-Americans we have at Gettysburg, of course, a distinguished career after that in the FBI too. But And now you're an assistant coach. You're still hanging around with, with us, hanging out with our student athletes. So there's probably some familiar faces out there for you. So Kirby, you can, you can fill in the blanks now that I hit the high points. All right, well, first of all, uh, thank you to everybody. This is a great opportunity. A little different because I'm back here actually in the community uh, coaching. It's, it's a great experience. One of the best experiences now I can say is, is seeing Mike, Mike Ayers. He doesn't know this, but what a pride when I came in seeing the program with him. He wears this for his country, ROTC, and, and, I, and I still remember that. And it, was, uh, it, it, it didn't work out for me uh, the way cause, uh, that I wanted here because I was a defensive back. And they switched me to running back. Oh. And then, you know, that was, uh, it was, but, you know, I'm, the experience is what experience is. You come to play. Yeah. And I really came here because at the time, as Mike would know, uh, they had um, Army and Air Force ROTC. 
I had an mm-hmm. appointment to West Point. I went to Boys State and I was going to go there, but I didn't want to. I went to the pre uh, that they do at a place in uh, Jersey. And I said, I don't know why I don't do that. So uh, ended up coming to Gettysburg. I kind of thought it was a military academy when I came here. A guy hijacked me and I mm-hmm. uh, kind of fell in love with uh, the campus and things here. And, and it, it truly worked out for me. My experience here, I remember um, it's about Damantha. There was uh, Stan Gray was from Baltimore area. I had great roommates. I just had a great experience, but that wasn't, I don't think the norm. Like I remember Perry Clark so well playing basketball and just being, you know, cause I came from a highly competitive athletic of being at Neptune, you know, playing Camden, the guys with basketball and, and everything. So my world was surrounded by athletics and also Air Force ROTC, which was what I thought my career was gonna go into is flying jets. And this was a, a situation where it, where everything everything fit. But you know, on, on campus for me, it was it was it was some difficult things coming through, which I'm not going to really bear all, all that now. But the the solid factor was the athletic group that I was around were I considered uh, um, basic, basically uh, men. There were there was uh, maturity. There was an understanding. And with that, uh, kind of like what uh, was said um, uh, prior uh, by Mike Ayers, you know, I went to, I ended up being a, a Teak member of fraternity, always now, uh, you know, got stones thrown at me from SAE or Phi Delta or other fraternities because I didn't go to the football fraternity. But, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's so um, after I graduated, uh, I, I actually signed a contract to play up in Canada. Uh, with Toronto Argonauts. I had a crooked eyed guy from general manager from Toronto Argonauts, G.I. Albright came in the locker room and said, here's a contract for you to play. And I remember Anthony Davis, who was from USC, was there about my same size. And he right. was in a car accident. And uh, Theismann had just left there. I said, well, this might be good. Well, you know, it wasn't a good move, but, you know, I did it. Uh, I had my Air Force commitment. So I was kind of uh, challenging what I wanted to do. Uh, so I did do my Air Force commitment. I got my commission uh, out of Penn State. Um, Perry Clark, one of the, your schools that you were you were with there. And uh, after that, kind of uh, found my way out, went to a couple of NFL teams. Um, and I really didn't know. I really wanted to go in the Air Force, but I wanted to fly. The FBI was something regimented for me because my dad was Army Air Corps. I just saw him yesterday. I just got back from seeing him um, about three or four hours ago. He's 95. And um, and so that's the FBI got into that. Uh, my background, I was fortunate enough because I did speak Russian that I actually got in in the FBI and my career was 30 years. I had a great career there, fortunate to be in New York. And um, and my uh, and my time there was was as as much a footprint of what Gettysburg taught me in dealing with that type of environment with the FBI, uh, you know, because you and when being a minority student at Gettysburg for me was a lot of uh, understanding, um, uh, poise, and, uh, and and reflecting on yourself and being uh, committed uh, to what your plan was. And uh, I think Gettysburg really uh, made that for me going forward into the environment that was in, a, in the environment as the FBI was. So after I retired there in 2012, my wife is from uh, Gettysburg. I met her here as an usher <laughs> at a basketball game. And uh, <laughs> it was a roundabout way, but we finally got together and I moved back here. And um, I had my tactical training business. I had some spots on CNN and some other tactical things I was doing. And um, I've left that basically. And I'm, I'm coaching and I'm happy to be coaching track because track was my first love. The guys... Uh, and all you'll laugh at this, but I'm the probably only athlete that you you wouldn't think this, who never won a dual meet in his high school, uh, in the hundred because I was running nine seven, but the guy in front of me was running nine four. John Chambers who went to Seton Hall, What's so the uh, uh, then you know, so that's why coming here was kind of like a breath, as all you know the the environment that we ran in here in in the uh, in, in the in the competition. So happy to be coaching here. Uh, uh, happy to have the connection with people that I do know and to hear 
of those that are going to be on the board uh, here answering answering questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kirby. And now I want to turn it over to Tony Nicholson, who's class of 1991 from Gatorsburg, Maryland. Four years on the basketball team, 28 mm -hmm. starts and 70 games. And you were here in the early days of George Petrie, too. He came in as a I rookie was. coach, I think your sophomore year, possibly. So that I would have a lot of questions for you based on that. But okay. we'll, we'll save that for another day. So yeah. and you've been working at DuPont for the last 20 some years, too. So, Tony, if you want to take the floor and update the group. Yeah, no doubt. I was thinking you should have let me go first. You got a pretty impressive list of guys. <laughs> you kind of you kind of gave everybody the rundown. First of all, good good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Absolutely. Uh huh. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So, um, my name is Anthony Nicholson on campus. I was pretty much I went by Tony at the time. I was a lot younger. So as I got older, I was like, man, maybe Anthony sounds a little better. Makes me sound older, at least anyway. So I was at Gettysburg from 1987 to 1991. Uh, and I grew up about maybe an hour north of campus in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And uh, Gettysburg for me was a natural fit. I went to a relatively small high school in Montgomery County. And um, I'm familiar with a lot of the schools that were mentioned in the DC area. We kind of played them in summer leagues and things when I was in high school. So at the time, 87, I was recruited by coach Don Anderson who since passed away, unfortunately. That kind of surprised me. He was here, he was at Gettysburg, my, um, freshman and into my sophomore year, great man. He made an instant impression on my parents. And that pretty much, they pretty much decided that I was going to go to Gettysburg and be under his care. So it just goes a long way as to show how a coach can be such a influential figure in your life. And Coach Anderson was definitely an intro, intro, influential figure in mine, excuse me. So um, Coach Petrie did take over my sophomore year, which would have been 1988, excuse me. And uh, we went, went well, great guy. He brought that Princeton offense, which was kind of spread out and cutting. A little bit different style that I was used to, but I quickly adapted, and uh, it, it was great. Um, as most everyone said, my time at Gettysburg was outstanding. I made a lot of great friends, made a lot of, met a lot of great people, experienced things that kind of go with me today. And um, honestly, I think I didn't really – I talked with uh, Devin about – uh, some of my experiences at Gettysburg a couple weeks ago and then I got to thinking I was like man I really enjoyed my years there I didn't really I kind of let it go once you get married and you have children and you start doing things that a husband and a father would do you forget certain things in your life that were very influential on you and my time at Gettysburg was definitely that um, after leaving Gettysburg I moved back to my parents hometown of Richmond Virginia and I started working at uh, DuPont which is a fortune 500 chemical company um, located here in Richmond. And I've had tons of positions within a company, but my current role, I'm a supply chain manager for DuPont. And I pretty much, my job, I keep it simple. I get raw materials in and make sure that finished product goes around the world where it was supposed to go. So it's a lot of responsibility. I love what I do. I'm pretty good at it. And I think my education at Gettysburg prepared me exactly for what I'm doing right now. Um, uh, on a given day, um, leaps and bounds ahead of my peers and my competition. And I think DuPont sees me as a clear asset. And a lot of what I learned and what I did at Gettysburg is, is you can attribute to that. So I'm looking forward to tonight. Honestly, I think with some of the men that talked before me, I think I'm going to learn more than I will probably teach tonight. So I'll be paying close attention to, <laughs> to some of the answers that they give. And I'm going to try not to be such a spectator because I think as, as I'm sitting here listening, I'm thinking I wish I had had an opportunity to talk to these three gentlemen when I was at Gettysburg. So I think the college is off to a great start in terms of uh, including alumni into directing the, the, the career paths and the, the social paths of the current students. So this is a great idea. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Tony. It's great having you on this too. And that's exactly what we're trying to do is establish that, that connection and bridge these, some of these gaps that exist between different sections of Gettysburg community. So as long as we yeah. can do that, we can advance and you know, create a better tomorrow. <laughs> so that's a great lead in into our final member of our esteemed panel here. So 
Also from the early 90s, we have Donna Burke, class of 92, which like Tony, she also came in with a new head coach on the basketball side of things playing for Mike Kirkpatrick. So you, of course, Donna, you're from New York, New York, and now you're on the West Coast. And, you know, we, we were joking earlier about your rebounding totals. Donna's, of course, holds many rebounding records or held a lot of rebounding records here on the basketball court as well. She's still the single game holder uh, at 23 rebounds. So Donna, do you want to say a few words? Good evening, everyone. Well, actually, it's pretty early here on the West Coast. So thank you so much, Corey, for reaching out. I also want to thank Devin. I did see him there. It's good to see you again. Um, I'm extremely happy to be here. Uh, I, as I'm going to echo exactly what Tony said in terms of I wish that we had this opportunity when we were at Gettysburg. We, once in a while, we get a couple of alumni come in and talk to us, but um, the wonders of technology. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm also happy that we didn't have that technology going to college because I don't think I probably would have made it through all four years at Gettysburg with all that document. So I'm kind of good with that. Um, so while I was at Gettysburg, you know, besides playing basketball, I did dabble in volleyball. Yeah. My set in my sophomore year. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't even know how Kirby you did more than one sport. I could not handle it. I literally, mm -hmm. I could not because I was playing volleyball fall semester and then basketball would start up. And you know, my love has always been basketball. Mm -hmm. So uh, I only did that for a year and I was like, I went straight to basketball after that. Um, I was very much involved with you, with you um, which Tony forgot to mention. He was very involved with that also, uh, as well as um, I was part of the Intercultural Resource Center, which um, they actually had a program called MyEye, which was the Minority Youth Educational Institute, where we, we had an opportunity to kind of do a big brother, big sister program with a lot of the, um, the kids in town, which I thought was very ben beneficial, not only for them, but also for myself. Yeah. Um, particularly being, you know, the youngest of 13 children, it was great to have like a little sister that I could help guide along the way. Um, after leaving Gettysburg, I followed my passion for music and I've been in the music industry for over 30 years. Currently working at Pandora, so division of Sirius XM. Um, we did a little poll earlier with our panelists, uh, students and uh, apparently, uh, Elijah's mom also listens to Pandora, so thank you. Um, but um, we also have SoundCloud, um, SiriusXM, um, as well as Stitcher. So if you guys are into podcasts, those are all the rage. So I have an opportunity to work with Fortune 500, 100 companies, um, actually with a couple of our Gettysburg alumni, um, particularly Clorox. So Troy Datcher, who's on our the Gettysburg board, uh, he's one of my clients. So it's always nice that you know everything comes full circle. Uh, I don't know about you guys, um, for the alumni, but anytime I see someone with a Gettysburg College like T-shirt or any reference, I'm like, oh my God, you went there. Um, because it's, it's few and far between, particularly on the West Coast. It's just that instant affinity and you just start talking about it until they tell you what year they graduate. And then I realize how much older I am with them. Yeah, exactly. it's all, it's all good, I'm young at heart. Um, I, uh, you know, obviously there's, uh, I'm so happy Corey that you're having this, this uh, panel discussion because in light of all of what's been going on in the world, um, you know, I also have always been very vocal uh, within my company and particularly whether it's growing up being at Gettysburg, being the only black female on the women's basketball team, the only one in my dorm. And then also finding that when I got into the work world, uh, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion was always a big part of who I am. And it's part of my purpose as a leader. So I've joined um, our revenue organization at uh, Pandora as a member of our diversity and inclusion team. And I'm very much active with the hiring and talent acquisition portion of it because we need to get more people in mm -hmm. our company that look like me. And mm -hmm. I'm in a position now being at the company in my role and being uh, able to bring other people in, mentor them and help them through the process is for me is part of my, my 
my purpose and my life mission. So um, looking forward to the conversation today. I'm looking forward to hear from, again, my fellow panelists, as well as from you, from the students, because I'm encouraged about what a uh, stance you guys are taking. Um, because as uh, Generation Zs, you guys are really are the ones that are making change in this, in this world. So I'm um, excited to hear what you guys have to say. Thank you, Donna. That's a great segue to the questions that we have prepared from our student athlete panel. And we're gonna tee it up with a question from field hockey player, Emma Bertrando. She's got a good start here. So Emma, why don't you go ahead and ask the alums and if the alums, if we could do maybe one or two, if you want to answer, unless the student athlete asks for opinions from all of you, because I am conscious of both your time and the student athlete's time, because I think they have to study. At least I hope. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm so, sure. I know many of you have great stories to tell and everything. So we'll try, <laughs> we'll try to get to everybody as, as much as possible, given the time. So Emma, go ahead. Yeah, so my question is, you guys all mentioned how Gettysburg really prepared you. But have you found that there are any other like racial challenges that have that you face now that are different from your athletic career in Gettysburg? I, you know, I'd like to jump in on that one. Um, it's funny because I think the times have kind of repeated themselves. When I was at Gettysburg, one of the major issues were standing for the national anthem. And you were challenged as a black man to be able to stand up and, and represent. And Mike can attest to that. I mean, that was a huge deal. And we kind of had to go through it in the sea with Colin Kaepernick and now in the NFL and NBA and what they're going through. And, um, you know, my position was that I felt like no matter how I felt that this country, uh, that there should be respect for the anthem and then, um, and I wound up standing where a lot, I caught a lot of grief from some folks on campus, but there was a lot, it was a time where your values were challenged. There was a lot of changing going on in the world. And, 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 and as a black person, you were trying to get a foothold on all of that. And Gettysburg was just a microcosm of that. And, um, and it was, it, you know, I heard one of the panelists talk about that they went back to their dorms and did a lot of reflecting. And I think that was so accurately said because it was a lot of reflecting where it taught us during my time that you had to stand for something and you had to be able to articulate what you stood for and standing for it was more for your own identity, self-worth and about you and not so much about what social media says like it is now or popularity like it is now, but it was the thing that grounded you as a person. And I think that process is funny because a lot of the issues that are now being talked about was around then. Um, so um, I think it's, it's come, it, it's a shame that we're still dealing with some of the same issues that were dealt with back in the 70s. Mm. That's a good point. Interesting. Obviously, Perry, you, Mike, and Kirby are kind of from that same generation, that late 60s, 70s. Um, I'm curious to hear the take from uh, Tony, uh, but like maybe your take on that same question too, uh, which, you know, you're uh, basically a generation later. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, when we entered Gettysburg, when I entered Gettysburg in 87, and during my years there, it was kind of a soft period as far as social issues taking over or captivating what we were thinking about. Um, the one that really struck everyone's nerve was the Gulf War took place right in like 90 into 91. And at that time, there really wasn't much unrest about the decision to enter into the Gulf War. So it was kind of a, a lull, kind of a lull. Um, but to there's always space to try to improve the plight of folks that you feel may not have the opportunity that you do. And I think Donna touched on a couple of things, it's just folks in the community that we would interact with. And they were always so proud of us and they wanted us to do well. And I took, 
I took that to mean don't blow the opportunity, don't waste the opportunity, cherish it and do the best that you can. And I think to answer the young lady's question, just being an athlete at Gettysburg and being an athlete in general, you learn how to compete. So once you get out into the business world, you understand that you are competing every day and there's nothing, you don't wanna go home second. You don't wanna go home second. You wanna go home first every day. So that's the one thing that I kind of carry with me is that I'm constantly competing. I'm constantly looking to be number one. I have a, an 18 year old son and I've yet to tell him, hey, when you leave, try to be mediocre today. I always tell him, try to be great today. Nobody, nobody shoots for mediocrity. So that's the one thing as an athlete that I've always carried with me. And it's kind of been something that I know that like when I was at Gettysburg, that was the thing. You just learn how to compete. If I can just, first of all, Tony, that's amazing. You guys don't understand. I know only Tony is like an 18, 19 year old. So just to hear you speak like this, it's, it's so proud of you. Um, so uh, for me, I don't know if you guys have ever done this, but stay at Gettysburg during the summer. Completely different than Gettysburg uh, when you're on campus. I so never did that. Yeah. I did that. So yeah. it's completely different, um, particularly around July 4th holiday when they reenact the Civil War. Yeah. That part <laughs> for me was just a, what's going on here? And I'm from the Bronx, who's pretty yeah. integrated. I didn't know what was going on. It was a completely different world during that time. That was probably the most difficult time that I had at the college, but not necessarily being at the college. It just happened to be there over the summer. Yeah. Um, let me just tell you, that was the first and only summer I spent there. Um, <laughs> but uh, I just remembered after experiencing that, um, you know, and, and Peria talked about how things are definitely cyclical uh, in the world. And for me, it was just, you know, the Confederate flags that were flying everywhere. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, being a, um, a black woman, you know, walking down the street in certain areas of town, I didn't feel comfortable with. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I like to say that that's changed, at least I hope it has, but unfortunately right. it's something that I, you know, have been sensitive to and was always sensitive while I was there. Right. Yeah. Well, I, it, they, they had a hard enough time keeping me there during the year, more or less the summer. They would tell you every week and I'm from Washington, DC. And yeah. I can tell you exactly. Exactly, it's 90 minutes from the campus yep. to my house. And right, I was right. home a lot. So I yep. didn't, I never stayed in the summer. So I can I only know. imagine. We didn't, have, we didn't have, like, you know, now they have the bus that goes. My, my right. niece actually graduated last year from Gettysburg. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So she used to take that, you know, that bus. Actually, she had a car. So I didn't have a car then. But, you know, but the first year she took that bus directly back to New Jersey. We didn't have that option. So I had to mm -hmm. make with what I had to do and stayed at Anderson House. $25 for the entire summer. That was Oh, wow. Yeah. And I worked at Lincoln Diner, guys. That's oh, right. I will oh, never wow. go into food service ever in my life. Ever again. <laughs> that's, that's funny that, that uh, yeah, that's funny Mr. Perry says that because it's like right up Route 15 and you're basically in Maryland in like 20 minutes. That's funny. That's funny. So I want to I want to allow one of our men's basketball players to jump in here and I'll just go alphabetically. So Jake, you got a question for a member of the panel here? Yes, sir. Um, I've actually got a question specifically for uh, Perry. Um, I understand that you had a, quite the tenure coaching college basketball. So one question that I had was, what is the college game doing to promote diversity, equity, inclusion um, at the division one level that we could incorporate at the D3 level and on campus as well? Well, a lot of things are going on. In fact, I'm working right now with the NCAA. The number two guy at the NCAA is a guy named Stan Wilcox who played at Notre Dame. And he was president of the Black Coaches Association when I was on the board. And they are setting up a lot of programs to help with diversity. And again, diversity and understanding what diversity is about. It's about trying to bring people from different backgrounds together so there's more of a common understanding and, and you can kind of understand the different problems and situations and all. 
And one of the major things to me in diversity is if you is the way we communicate. When I came to Gettysburg, the way I was used to communicating in out of Washington, DC was different from a guy communicating from Stranton, from Stranton, Pennsylvania. And things that the way we did things, our interaction, our contact, our vocabulary and all was different. And that didn't make us better or worse, but it was different. And so to me, as I've matured, diversity is really important because this is a big country and it's got a lot of different ways of doing some things and understanding how to communicate and interpret things from folks that come from different backgrounds is extremely important. I remember uh, when I first got to Gettysburg, I thought I was a pretty good student. The first time I turned in a paper, it came back bleeding. And, 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 and the professor informed me that I really needed to step it up if I planned on making it there. And that was the first self-analysis that I had to go through of whether or not I was gonna take that or whether or not I was gonna to try to maybe opt out and go, do, go someplace else where it would be my way of communicating and doing things was gonna be accepted. So to answer your question, that is a huge point in college athletics today. Um, a lot of things are going on to better the student athlete. I don't know how it filters down to division three, but uh, you know, like right now, they're allowing kids to have the senior year this year back, and yeah. the school has to pay for it. They're doing you can transfer and be able to be eligible right away. So there are a lot of things that are going on trying to, you know, uh, give the student athlete more of a say so and more growth in the intercollegiate pro uh, process. Thank you. That was good. Thank you, Coach Clark. And I want to turn it to Meredith Brown now. Meredith, I know you sent me some questions earlier, and you have one um, about the ROTC and experiences at Gettysburg that I think uh, Michael Ayers and Kirby Scott could both answer too. Do you want to ask that question? Yeah, so um, I was wondering how you guys kind of balanced ROTC and athletics because they're both so demanding, and then how your experiences in both of those and being in both of those programs together translated to your life after college. Hmm. Mike, you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Right. Sorry. Uh, yeah, quite frankly, uh, I was drafted in uh, the summer of my freshman year. Oh, wow. The Vietnam War was very active. So right. to avoid the uh, draft, I joined Army ROTC. Uh, it was a great experience for me. It was a two-year program, uh, military science. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the physicality of it, uh, the military science. So I, uh, I did my uh, two years uh, as a, uh, at college. I was commissioned. Well, I had started my career at Bell, uh, Bell Telephone Company, but they gave me a six-month leave to go to Officer Candidate School uh, I completed my, uh, my uh, schooling there, uh, made rank, uh, but really uh, I uh, did ROTC to avoid uh, the draft, but I made my commitment. I did my summer camps, and after eight years, I retired as a captain. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, for, for me here, it was a, it was a, a different uh, focus for me because in actuality, uh, because my dad, Army Air Corps, which I mentioned before in the beginning, um, it was something about that. Um, I was born uh, in, a, in a really poor, close to, uh, uh, in, in, in the, really the mountains of uh, Virginia. And uh, the move translating here, the only thing that I looked at as a person of color, of people that were looked at were people not police uniforms, but military coming back home and my dad and, and some of my uncles. So it was more, I wanted that structure or identity, not knowing what that was as a uh, minority child growing up, you, you wanna have a sense of surrounding something that's gonna give you a purpose. And that was kind of where that I was because uh, you know there wasn't any other route for that. So coming to Gettysburg was, was obviously a difference for me going to West Point 
uh, the rigidity there. How did that fit in for me? As I told you, uh, speaking back about Mike Ayers, I was just pretty cool to see, you know, that, you know, Mike Ayers <laughs> on the program and, you know, just, and there's something about that. You say the commitment to be an athlete is one, the commitment to be at Gettysburg College with um, the, um, Perry, you can't never beat me how bad I was a student. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it was, it's, it's a matter of then trying to fit that in to your identity on campus to what you love. And I love sports. And I remember seeing you know, people that I've seen play, I know like Perry and, and the, the, the caliber of athletics that they were playing, uh, you know, it, it was, it drove you to the ROTC part of it for me a great fit because I was driven. I wanted to be a pilot and weren't very many African-American pilots. And that's the Tuskegee Airmen, which a lot of things were just aired on that. Uh, that was what I wanted. Now, like Mike, I got a deferment. I signed a professional contract, not even have a sense about what the heck I was doing. Because here I am <laughs> ROTC, I signed a professional contract and you know, I still ran track and I wasn't supposed to because I signed a contract so I'm just, I'm just doing my thing, right? And uh, so what, what happened was peacetime is different, RATC, I believe. I don't know how the nature is now. I have one athlete that's on a track team, and I try to support him as much as I can with the uh, rigors that they have with the drills and everything else, that the commitment that you have. Uh, and hopefully there's a blend for that they – they relish the fact that you have somebody in ROTC that's committed to the school that they can really identify and show that they're part of the program. If you follow what I'm saying, I, I think when I was there, I was group commander. I ended up being group commander of the of the Air Force ROTC before I left, and they were always really uh, positive of whatever I needed to do so far as football was concerned, and. Uh, you know, I, I did my, after my junior year, I, uh, I did my uh, training during the summer and got my commission. And I also, um, you know, my final uh, rank was captain. Because then when I went to the FBI, you had to go in on reserve status because you can't be uh, an FBI agent at the time and still be committed to the Air Force and called up for any wartime activity or things of that mm -hmm. nature. Now, presently with the, uh, after 9-11, and, um, you know, I, Donna, I was an agent in New York for 27 years. So, you know, I, I know New York, like, you know, uh, the 9-11 was my changing point for me uh, with what that I, uh, my life, I was a SWAT team leader in New York, um, is, is the understanding that the commitment that you have as an athlete should be something paired and shared by whatever uh, people that are involved in your administration. Meaning an ROTC, all right, you have this athletic uh, commitment and everybody knows you have, have academic commitments. So it's gotta be a blend for that. What it did for me was in my career, the structure in ROTC, the organization and the different things bode me well in the FBI with the rigors I had through and training that I did with that. And I can always say that there was never an issue for me because of ROTC with my commitment to what I was for athletics, uh, so far as the academics, who's to say, because my commitment with the regime of what the academics were for ROTC, uh, was that a negative for the academics or not? I mean, I graduated, I would believe I was successful in what that I did and, and I attribute um, your mental uh, commitment to, to making it work. Hmm. Thank you, gentlemen. And now we'll switch it off to Max Pernetti. You got a question for the panel, Max? Yeah, I do. I actually have one that could apply to all of you guys. So maybe if some of you guys want to like do a short answer about it or like however many of you guys want to answer. Um, I was going to say, was there anything about uh, Gettysburg that made you as an African-American athlete feel comfortable attending and competing? Uh, yeah, most definitely. I think one of the keys uh, for me, uh, being an African American, uh, is that you want to make sure that uh, that you are good enough. And Gettysburg showed me that I was good enough. I mean, I tutored Latin, uh, I tutored folks on things, and I was a unlike 
Perry, I was a great student. <laughs> so, uh, but I wanted to compete and Gettysburg made me compete. I mean, I had to up my game, uh, but they respected me as a student. I remember talking to Professor Gladfeller and some of the other folks. So I think that uh, Gettysburg, when I went to uh, my first assignment, my first assignment in Bella, Pennsylvania, telephone company, I go to a location and I'm the only black person in the whole building. Uh, I just left Gettysburg and I come to my first job assignment. So, uh, okay, I dealt with it because I'm used to dealing with football members, SAE, Teak. So I didn't see any issues there. So Gettysburg not only prepared me academically to handle it, but also socially because I dealt with folks. That's what I would say. I don't know if you guys heard what Mike just said, but he said he had Professor Gladfelder. I believe that's a building. Yeah, that's Tony, you were thinking the same thing, right? I was yeah, like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. you guys, you young people, you young guys. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, so much cool. knowledge. Um, for me, I, I feel, um, first of all, Max, I appreciate it. You said a short answer because obviously the guys are a little long winded. Let's have a female on here. I'm going to have to represent. I'm only representing myself. Yeah, well, we're old. <laughs> but uh, I, I think for me, um, playing college sports um, allowed me an opportunity to be my authentic self. Uh, having a strong uh, coach in Coach K, who mm -hmm. was like a father figure as well as an authoritative figure for me, um, helped me through my career. And um, just being part of a team. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, I've taken to, to what I do now with my work. Um, so I felt that, you know, my experience at Gettysburg probably wouldn't have been as positive if I had not been part of a team. Mm -hmm. um, because the team definitely got me through um, a lot of things. Um, particularly, I'm the type of person who likes to multitask. So I need to have, um, you know, something that's active along with something that's going to challenge my mind at the same time. So um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I think if in hindsight, you know, I definitely would have chosen Gettysburg, which is a, a question you guys should probably ask everyone now. Uh, I still would have chosen Gettysburg because the opportunities that I got at Gettysburg, I think, allowed me to shine a lot more being at a small liberal arts college rather than going to whether it was a predominantly black college or, or university right. or even a larger school and it prepared me for life you know being the one african-american in a dorm one in on the forget about our basketball team within the conference yeah you know, no doubt heading yeah and then heading into the work world you know i yeah. fit right in I had no problem, you know, because I was able to adjust to a lot of different types of personalities. And I always gave myself an opportunity whenever I got into a game, I got into a classroom, or if I get into a boardroom, I'm going to participate. And, yeah. uh, and I think Gettysburg definitely helped to shape that for me. That's a good answer. That's pretty cool. So, so people on the panel should know like I was there to watch some Madonna's games and she was unstoppable. She was unstoppable. She did what she wanted to do on the court. It was unreal. It was, it was, it was basically unfair because she was, she was taller, faster and stronger than everybody. And it was just, it was, it was just, it wasn't fair. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. Um, Thanks for the mail. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. It was must see TV. She was, she was unstoppable. But in terms of answering the question, I think for me, Gettysburg was, it was the, even the Centennial Conference was much like the conference I played in in high school. I mean, even the, the demographics, even the people, they just looked the same. So it was just, I felt really just right at home. It kind of fit me perfect. And I think just by my personality, I wasn't really one to go outside of myself at 18 or 19 years old. So it was just a natural transition and it fit for me. But I think the young man, he asked a great question. I think physically, I was more than prepared to play basketball. But mentally, I wasn't prepared to be a leader and to lead people and to motivate people through adversity. And as an athlete, that's what separates the good ones from the great ones is how you manage adversity.
Kirby Perry, did you want to weigh in? Well, I, well, I think the, the greatest support group or the greatest support I had were the other black student athletes, the other blacks that were on campus. I mean, I think it was only 33 of us. And so, I mean, I thought that that was a real strong support group and my coaches, because um, it's funny, everybody saying that they were the only black to participate. I was the only black on the team. A lot of times I walked into arenas and I was the only black there, or maybe the other team had one player. Wow. And I thought that the coaches really, uh, Bob Holton was really, he was very quiet. He was older. Um, he smoked a lot of cigarettes in practice, <laughs> but he always, I always felt like he supported me. I mean, he would be at half court smoking cigarettes and everything. It was a different time, fellas. You know, and young ladies, it's just, yeah. a different, it's just a different time. And, uh, but, and then you go to certain places like Lehigh and Lafayette and, you know, and they were Ryder and they would really challenge you. You know, other players would challenge you and wanted to see in black players, how tough you were or, you know, how you were going to respond. And you had to really let them know that, you know, you weren't about that, you know. And so, uh, but I think that um, it's certainly the support was on campus with the other students. And despite what Mike said, I was a pretty good student. I came from the MAFA and I, I mean, I, yeah. you know, you got to give us a, 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 a little bit of respect now, but it was just a different time because they, and this is where I give Gettysburg a lot of credit looking back. They really went out and they sought out in New York, Philadelphia, Washington, uh, Baltimore, and tried to bring in black students and give them an opportunity with grant money and funding. And, and, and they did not have the inner structure to, to take care of a lot of the needs, but it, it was a start, and I think a lot of us benefited from it. And uh, and it, it, and I think again, I think we made Gettysburg better, and Gettysburg made us better. Yeah, no doubt. No yeah, I doubt. think the uh, my end, you know, I, it's a transition because and with Perry and, and Mike and the middle with it talked about with uh, Tony and Donna. There was a period of time there where that the inner city. The opening up of that was problematic because didn't have the support and things didn't didn't and I, it's sad to see that happen mm -hmm. because uh, you, you know and to your question and your point um, I always felt comfortable or confident and that's part of my makeup you know it's be an athlete commitment and what you do mm -hmm. um, so especially in, in the in the FBI the bureau there was I mean there was thirteen. Well, it actually had the Bureau of 4,000 agents. There was 200 and some African-Americans. The first office I went to, I was the only, only black person there. And the incident, I had to be taken out of that particular office because of things I've seen, uh, particularly that happened at the time. But one of the things I want to tell you confidence-wise, I was in charge of the 1996 um, immediate action plan for the Olympics, you know, the Olympics, all the venue sites and everything that was there. And I remember walking into... Um, uh, to talk to outside people to handle some of the submerged uh, things that need to be done with the with the crew, you know, because I, you know, there's a lot of different facets for that, and um, with the other three uh, team leaders from other teams is going to assist, and the guy walks up past me to the other people and say, "Oh yeah, well, I'm, I know you're the team leader, and what you're doing here," and and they all looked at him and looked at me and said, oh, you know," and the guy finally knew. He said, "Well." It's, Oh, well, it's a black guy, huh? You know, you know. <laughs> not just being frank. You know, that's that's what it is. And it didn't it didn't phase me because in in the you know you're out there, you're the professional, you're doing your job. Yeah. My men and the people I were around knew what the capability and what it was. Yeah. But that's just a, a that's just that's why some things full circle yeah, yeah. are just the same yeah. way that they are. You know, they're, they're the same. They're actually the same way that they are. So, um, you know, that's what's. Uh, and I think Donna brought it up. I so see their passion about it. And as, as everybody else has on the panel, it's disheartening for me now to see where we're at because the FBI is conservative. It's, I'm not even going through my hard battles here, but the, your question was my commitment in Gettysburg made me feel comfortable in that environment because I was comfortable in myself. 
But um, there's a lot of things changed, but a lot of things remain the same. But, you know, everything at Gettysburg solidified and made me a better person to handle things that I handled, for sure. Thank wow. You. Thank you, everyone. And, and Perry, I, I have something. Uh, Devin shared something with me earlier this week, and I believe you're in this photo. This is one uh -oh. of the early, earliest iterations of the Black Student Union. Oh, yeah. Devin, 1971, <laughs> oh, you said? Oh, wow. Yeah. So, and I, I believe, Coach Clark, that's yeah. you in the upper left? Yeah, that, that was a whole different body ago. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then, yes. <laughs> that part of Plank Gym? Where is that? Yeah, yeah that is. Yeah, yeah. Corner of Plank Gym. Yep. Yeah, yeah and, plank. and down there in the corner is uh, Arnold Hansen, who Kirby will remember, Mike will remember, and Mr. Oh, Clark will remember. That was the president yeah. of the college at the time. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And where the cursor is right now, the uh, the guy sitting on the left in the in the uh, second row is Buddy Glover, the class of seventy one, wow. who uh, was a very good friend to me and to the archives. Uh, he was a football star at McCaskey High in uh, Lancaster. Actually, came to Gettysburg hoping to uh, to play ball here. Broke his ankle in his freshman year, so that never happened. Instead, he became one of the great activist pioneers. Uh, started the first black uh, student publication in the history of Gettysburg College in 1969 and became wow. one of our great alumni. Uh, distinguished alumni award winner two years ago and sadly, very sadly for everyone, passed away about a week and a half ago. But uh, because of Mr. And I tell Clark you, and, and I, I Mr. Tell you what, Glover, I wanted to show this picture tonight. Well, I tell you what, he was a tremendous human being. He helped me tremendously. He used to look at me as a wild young guy from Washington, D.C. and said, you got to calm it down a little bit, kid. You got to calm it down. And he kind of kept me in order as, as a father figure, but really an intellect and just a very, very special, special person. And for those of you that did not know this, this great history has been put together by the library, by Devin. Um, check out their latest newsletter. There's some great stuff in there, oral histories. The history of the BSU is in there, which was mm. fascinating, the different iterations that has gone through through the years, as well as um, an exchange program with a school in Tennessee as well in the late 60s and early 70s too. So check out the library newsletter too. Yeah, if, um, I, could, if I could just say, Corey, I was looking yeah. through our photo files, which you see right here. Uh, I was looking at the football team photo from 1975. In the, in the front row, you have Kirby Scott. Uh, behind him, you have Stan Gray and Steve Gibson right next to each other. And way back up in the top row, you have Mike Ayers and uh, Herb Clinton. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Herb. Yeah, so come, so, so come check out the archives. We got uh, sports stuff going way, way back. <laughs> well, we'll, cool. we'll turn it back to the questions here in the student athletes. And Nora Janzer, I believe you have a question for Donna Burke that concerns her work on the diversity board she's currently serving on with Pandora. Um, yes, I do. Um, so Donna, you mentioned you're on the board of diversity for Pandora. And I was wondering if there are any um, initiatives you have started at Pandora that you wish were present during your time at Gettysburg? That's a good question. Um, so actually, when I first got to Pandora before we were acquired by SiriusXM two years ago, so this was uh, about 12 years ago, um, I actually worked with um, the career development uh, department at Gettysburg. And I was able to instill the first inaugural um, sh job shadowing opportunity um, for current Gettysburg College students. So I was excited that I gave uh, students, current students, an, an opportunity to get into uh, and get a glimpse of what we do. Um, it's funny because when I was at Gettysburg, I was a uh, political science major and an African American studies minor. And now I, I'm in music and I'm in sales and marketing, completely different than what I started off with. So uh, a lot of people, you know, are tied to their majors and think that they can actually, um, you know, that's the only thing that they're gonna do in their life. 
Um, the best thing that could have happened to me was uh, being introduced to this whole world of radio and music and now streaming and podcasts. Uh, so I'm excited that I was able to bring that back to Gettysburg. And then for me, um, I'm very much involved with, uh, I had said that I chair the talent, uh, the hiring and talent acquisition uh, committee at the company because it allows me an opportunity to go out to um, colleges and universities as well as organizations and actively promote um, you know, our hiring, um, particularly amongst BIPOC, um, Black Indigenous people of color, um, as well as any underrepresented group to get them an opportunity to come to work at SM and or SoundCloud. Um, so I've utilized that and also, you know, I, I, you know, sometimes you're comfortable with what you know and what I know is I'm going to try to help a Gettysburg College student out where I can, particularly um, someone um, who is part of that underrepresented group and give them an opportunity. Because uh, if you don't have, and this is for anyone, if you don't have someone who is sponsoring you throughout your career, then you're missing out on a lot. Um, first, you start off with a mentor, and there you go. them, and then you need a sponsor. The sponsor is the person who's in the room that talks about you when you're not there, and it talks about you in a positive light that gives you an opportunity to advance uh, within your career, within the company. So um, I've taken upon myself since I've had several um, sponsors and mentors throughout my life that I've moved back where I can. All right, I think that brings us to our final student athlete. I, they have more questions, believe me, but this is Elijah's first chance to get in there and ask a question. So Elijah, go ahead. Hey, um, so I actually I actually had a question for Donna as well, um, but Perry might be able to answer too now that I saw he was in the, the BSU back then. Um, I was gonna ask um, if there were any uh, what were the challenges like that you face on campus? Like, especially Donna, I presume you're like a pretty active, active member since you uh, carry on into your professional career. Like what challenges did you face um, being like that figure for change on campus? And how does that like, how did that kind of prepare you? Because I feel like, did, uh, how does that translate to how you, or how you were prepared to, fight against those injustices in your professional career. Sorry, that didn't make any sense. Uh, but I think I can figure out what you're asking me. Um, so for me, um, being part of the, the BSU gave me an opportunity to um, be in a safe space uh, and talk to my fellow, um, you know, just someone who's on my same level where I felt that I wasn't being judged, where you can be your authentic self particularly if you had issues with like roommates, you know, if you had issues with professors, um, you know, our advisor um, actually helped us a lot. And uh, we worked closely with Dean Matthews from the IRC, who was uh, one of the biggest reasons why I came to, to Gettysburg. Um, it gave us, like I said, a, a safe space for us to um, be able to talk about issues um, that um, we felt as a group weren't being addressed. A lot of it had to do with, you know, the diversity, diversity issue. You know, for my class, there were 12 of us. Uh, I think at one time, maybe for, if you include international students, we maybe had 50 on campus. Um, mm -hmm. Every year when someone graduated, you always look to the freshman class and to see whether or not there was gonna be more coming that looked like you. Um, you know, which was always been a, a struggle and a challenge that the, the college had. Um, one of our biggest initiatives is that we wanted to um, bring a little bit of our culture into the college. So while we were at the college, we actually started step shows 
and had the opportunity for other students, other fraternities and sororities to see Tony's laughing, right? So the yeah. step shows where we didn't have um, yeah. traditional black fraternities and sororities, which I know there are a couple now at Gettysburg, which yeah. is nice. We had a hard time because we just didn't have the numbers to get enough right. people that were interested to actually um, bring these organizations or chapters to the school. So we we hosted step shows. Tony, I don't know if you remember, we had Yo MTV Raps, which was huge back then. I remember that. Um, I remember that. You know, it was before yeah. TRL, you know, it yeah. was huge. They were the game changers when it came to hip hop culture. And we actually had them at Gettysburg. Yeah, no State. doubt. You know, it wasn't Penn State, it was like Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So, yeah. you know, we were trying to find a way that we could bridge that gap and provide some education to the community at large and actually to the Gettysburg community in itself, because we did get a lot of locals who would come and be exposed to these type of programs. So that was our way of, of translating that back to the college. And, and it, for me, I feel that representation matters. Um, so if we can find something that um, is, is true to ourselves and we can bring to the masses, they start to, ad to adapt it. It's funny because for, um, for Yo MTV Rap, you know, which is, you know, pretty much, you know, rooted itself within the African-American culture, it has become pop culture now, mm -hmm. right? Um, hip hop has become pop culture. So it's something that it was great that we were able to introduce that and bring that to the college campus. Oh, Mike's you. talking, but I can't hear. Yeah, Elijah, uh, the, the BSU has always been a special part of the college. Even when I was there, uh, we brought in Alex Haley who wrote Roots, he was there. We brought in wow. Nikki Giovanni. So we did try to expose to college to our culture. And I think even in the corporate world, where I work at or where I did work at, it was important for me to bring uh, my culture to the job. Meaning that uh, I wanted them to know that I was a black man and that we had input and we did things. And certainly it was important for me to reach back and to help someone else as a mentor to show him how he needed to succeed in, the, in this uh, workplace. Because it's all about building relationships. Uh, when I was at Gettysburg, uh, Gene Hawes was the AD. And uh, when I was getting ready to graduate and look at my, uh, my, my job offers, uh, one of his frat brothers was uh, the VP at Bella PA. That's how I got the job. They told me to go interview. But I think it's all about building relationships, but staying true to yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to say that you're a member of the BSU. Because I remember back in the day, uh, some African-Americans didn't want to be a part of it because they thought it would look bad on their resume. But anytime you get express, uh, get the opportunity to show other folks what you're about, it's a good thing. And I'm quiet, Donna. <laughs> <laughs> 91 <laughs> Sorry, 92 <laughs> yeah. that's funny so each each of our student athletes on the panel has taken an opportunity to ask a question and i know they have more um i don't want to make them go in a certain order now so if if one of you wants to pose a question that maybe hasn't been answered yet Feel free to do so, Nora or, or Meredith, Max, Jake, Elijah, if you guys have another question. Emma. Um, I can go. Um, this has kind of already been answered in a few um, questions, but on my team, we have saying um, to be a difference maker, which like means to be the person that pushes the ball next to you on and off the field. So I was wondering um, for any of you guys, who are the difference makers in your life and what characteristics define these people? Whether um, they were a difference maker in your life at Gettysburg or even after you graduated? Mm, that's a good question. I, I can talk about, I'm big on sponsorship. So for me is my mentor that I've had throughout my entire career. Um, be, first of all, he's a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, which is something that I aspire to. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And I've seen through as he had to um, reinvent himself um, over the course of his career, um, particularly as um, his, his industry has changed, um, going from something that was a little bit more brick and mortar to now e-commerce, um, he had to adjust to that. Um, I saw how he was able to still have that, that what I called before in terms of purposeful leadership. Um, he's been consistent in terms of his, his mission and his mission has always been to show up and be his authentic self. And I use that as my, my guidance whenever I'm making decisions within my career um, to make sure that um, I am representing myself in a way that does not, um, is not true to who I am. Um, because that will show up. Like people will see when that passion is lost in you. I am um, very much forward facing in my, in my uh, position where I, I mm -hmm. work with clients directly and I need to build relationships with them and they can see when things are not authentic and I'm not being um, true to myself and not being truthful of what I'm presenting to them. So I utilize that as my guidance. So my mentor, um, we've had, you know, many iterations and many arguments and many fights, but, you know, we always go back to whether or not we're fulfilling what our purpose is. You know, in, in, in athletics, I've had a lot. Um, Morgan Wooten, my high school coach, who's in the mm -hmm. hall of fame is probably as far as how to live your life each day and how to be authentic and how to have principle was probably the cornerstone for me. But when I moved to Atlanta to coach at Georgia Tech, uh, I wound up meeting Andrew Young and he was just a remarkable person to be around and Atlanta was a different type of city at the time because it was the first city that embraced black, supported black. And um, Maynard Jackson was the mayor. Before I got there, we got to be friends. And he insisted that as that city grew, that black became a very, very important part uh, economically. And um, that changed and altered kind of my thinking and my approach to certain things. Um, and um, as a coach, probably John Chaney from Temple was mm -hmm. the guy that I most emulated and respected because of how, what he stood for. And if you talk about characteristics, you know, uh, when I was young, I came to Gettysburg to try to change the times. Now, as I'm older, the times have changed me. And I've learned to adapt and adjust and um, figure out ways through things. Um, and so I think that that's been a just, that's the important part of my development. Wow. Any other questions from uh, student athletes? Max, Jake, Elijah? I like how Corey just calls you out. I have a question. First of all, I have to say one thing. Mike Cantelli, can you go on screen? Because that man has not aged a bit. <laughs> Where is it? I don't see him. I know he's on. He just he's probably is on mute, and I just see his picture. But hi, Donna. I'm right here, Donna. I'm right here. I'm telling you, you have not <laughs> aged a bit. How you doing? I'm doing awesome. You're awesome. You guys are awesome. Thanks for doing all this. I spent many a days in that room. You know, That's funny. Up. I was just looking for Kelly Jones. Maybe she can throw me some gear. Just saying. I didn't care. <laughs> saying. That's funny. It's out there. I, listen, you throw me some gear, I'll throw you some Pandora stuff, whatever you want. SoundCloud, Stitcher, the even exchange, open barter. That's cool. 
And, and just so Kirby, Perry, and Mike know, Lefty Beiser is still running around. Campus. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my God. Lefty. Oh, my Joe goodness. Denali's around. We we see them occasionally, although not, not recently. Oh, oh, my God. Can I just pose a question to the student athletes? You sure can, Donna. Yeah. Yeah. So how are you guys doing? You know, there's a lot going on. You know, I, I applaud you for, for putting together this panel. How are you guys doing? Because there's... I have a 20, soon to be 22 year old on Sunday. So I know how it is navigating through school, virtual, not being around your friends, you know, learning, you know, some, some difficult life lessons while having to quarantine, you know, how's it going for you guys? It's a little frustrating, like not being able to play obviously, like, and the challenges of being at home are definitely there. Um, I would say it's really weird. I was talking to our coach, Coach Dunn today and Coach Elberg talking about how like this is like my first time since I, I was in like grade school not having a basketball season. Mm -hmm. And like it's kind of like an eerie feeling and like one that I never expected that I would have until like after I finished my playing career. But um, like outside of that, like it's just weird to be home. Like I was only at school for one semester. I'm a freshman. So um, I feel like I was just trying to starting to get used to it and like was ready to go back for second semester. But freshmen are all remote this semester. So I think a few freshmen are actually back on campus. They invited some back, but um, mm -hmm. I'm still at home and it's definitely weird, but uh, trying to handle it the best way possible. Mm -hmm. Meredith, how about you as one of the seniors? Yeah, it's definitely kind of odd. Um, you know, not having your senior season can be kind of tough, but to be completely honest, I've got such a great support system in my teammates and my coaches. And so I'm one of the ones who's on campus right now. And um, we've been having practices. There's only five of us total. So um, they're, they're kind of, I don't want to say laid back practices, but they're, they're not the same as they used to be. Um, a little bit kind of different stuff that we're doing, but it's really nice to still be able to get on the court and still interact with my teammates and my coaches and just having them through that. Um, it's been really nice, even though we're not all together. It's nice being around some of them, so. Any other questions from the alums to our student athletes? You can find out what dining services is making on a daily basis. <laughs> the athletes are all about it. That's funny. I actually got one question for Perry. This is kind of like a off top, more off topic question, but I was reading your bio. I saw that you were an assistant coach at South Carolina. I wanted to know what it was like being an assistant to Frank Martin. <laughs> that is a, now that is a good question. Oh, I get asked that a lot. I did a radio interview earlier today and, and they asked me the same thing. You know, well, I've known Frank for a long time. And uh, he's a different guy on the court and off the court. Um, he was never a great player. And so what we do in practice is really choreographed. And when you see him get really upset, it is something we have practiced over and over. Like we have five, we have five different ways we handle ball screens. And they were all called by the big guy. Mm -hmm. And so if the big guy messed up a call, Frank would go nuts because we practice it every day. And that's when you see him become the Frank Martin. Everybody looks at it and says, what is wrong with that guy? But if you <laughs> take him off the floor, number one, he's easy to talk to. He's funny. He, he likes to play practical jokes on you. Um, but on the floor, he just expects you to know what you're supposed to do. And when you don't, but the players understand that and they see that balance. So they're able to live through it. Um, what my, my biggest job, having been a head coach, is to try to interpret and prepare the guys what's going to happen if you, if you mess up. <laughs> and so you're kind of prepared for it. And so it doesn't take you off your game and you can continue the next play. But I get asked that question. I wish I had a dollar for every time I've been asked that question. But um, it, it, it was an experience. And I learned, I, you know, I learned a lot from him. And I thought I knew a lot coming in. But I, I've learned a lot when I worked. Uh, and it, it was a pleasant experience.
Thanks for answering. Meredith, I know you have, looking at your list of questions here, I think your, your last question is a really good question to ask our, our panel here and might be a, a good way to conclude what, what we're doing here too, if, if there's no more questions after that. So do you wanna go ahead and fire that off there? Sure, so this one is kind of a fun question. Um, just what's one of your most meaningful memories from here at Gettysburg? Oh, wow. I can take this one. The point <laughs> Maya Angelou spoke at full convocation. It was absolutely amazing. But the oh, best wow. part, BSU had, had brought her in. and But the best part, she was late. <laughs> about 45 minutes late to the actual, um, her speaking engagement, because she stopped at Lincoln Diner to have some cheesecake. <laughs> and she was savoring that cheesecake. And she told us when she came late and it's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> but, but amazing speaker, as we all know. And um, for me, it was, you know, I've seen a lot of celebrities and particularly musicians, but when I met her was for me, was like probably the most amazing opportunity that I could ever have. Um, particularly since in um, freshman year um, um, class, I remember our, she, how the cage bird sings and, and one of her famous quotes is, you know, try to be a rainbow in someone's cloud. Um, and to have her speak to the college campus and, and specifically spend a couple of minutes with me, even now when I think about it, I get goosebumps. So I'm thankful for Gettysburg for giving me that opportunity to meet her. Real quick, real, real quick before the rest of you answer this, since we showed a picture of Perry, I think it's oh. only right that we show a picture of Donna as well. So <laughs> here you go. Oh my goodness. That was my <laughs> short hair fade. Oh, <laughs> that was my short hair Wrong side drive. Exactly. <laughs> Look how short those shorts are. I think there's a problem there. <laughs> oh, that's uh, funny. I think we that's won awesome. that game. I'm going to say that. <laughs> Looks like a carry to me. I don't know. Oh, first of all, oh. what you never do is you never give a forward a ball outside of, like, uh, you know, outside that, that little key. This, I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know. All right, uh, Meredith's question. Uh, Coach Clark, you want to take that one? Most meaningful memory at Gettysburg College? Oh, wow. Um, I don't, uh, uh, two things come to mind. First of all, Gettysburg was the first time I ever had sardines on a pizza. <laughs> and so I will, uh, that, that's just different. And, uh, and late at night, that used to be what the guys would order for the dorms. And when you weren't putting up your own money, you just ate what was ordered. And, um, but I think, I don't, um, Dick Gregory came and spoke and um, that was tremendous for me. And I've always followed him since then, uh, his position on life and how to live your life and um, that. But I think probably was graduation day to see those that when we started, you saw in that picture, how many there were of us well, by the time we graduated, it was only four. Right. So to see those folks excited and going through that journey was a very, very special day. And we've always kept a bond and communication about that because, you know, we, 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 we made it through. And uh, so probably graduation day has its own special meaning to me. Mike, how about you? Same question, most uh, meaningful memory? Well, there's a story that I tell about my uh, first varsity game at Gettysburg College. Uh, I, mm. And I share this story in, in my corporate settings. I came from a high school where we never lost. I mean, we won. I, it was a great high school football program. So I come to Gettysburg, and the freshman year, I was pretty good. We were like two and two. But uh, we're playing the University of Delaware, 
and they were the defending national champs. Oh, and the wow. point spread was 60 points. Gettysburg <laughs> is going to lose by 60 points. And I go, no way. I mean, there's no way that a team that Mike Harris plays for is going to lose by 60 points. Well, the game starts. The first three times that they get the ball, they scored. They, <laughs> we got the ball, they scored. They blocked yeah. the punt, and it's up to the pass with a couple of fumble. The score was 21 nothing, and their offense have not been on the field yet. Final score, <laughs> Gettysburg 6, Delaware 66. So it was a bad start, but I share uh, that story. Uh, it keeps me humble, but uh, we got better. We recruited better. We got Kirby, and, you know, we got much better. But uh, yeah, right. that's my story. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. That's awesome. That's cool. Kirby, how about you? Uh, that's, that's tough one to follow up on. Um, well, one of them is kind of like a two, and I'll be short with it, uh, with this. The one is on college experience. The stadium, it's a uniqueness with Gettysburg Stadium when you're out there at football. I mean, because uh, I, I was going to go to Grambling. Lee Fobbs was the back. I remember that. I went to Grandma Stadium and some of the other black uh, schools. And it was like, the, it's not a large stadium, it's not a bowl, but there's something unique about looking across at Gladfelter. And, and even, I remember it was um, Mamie Eisenhower was there and it was Dan Day. And we came out a little early and I'm going, I mean, I know I'm old, right? Mamie Eisenhower, but you know, they had Dan Day. And it was, it was unbelievable. The, you look at the field and that I remember, and I was, you know, a sophomore then I think when that was, you know, and Mike was like my mentor as a running back and I'm looking at going like, this is, this is something. Anyway, that's a unique physical feeling there. And the other one was just here recently as a coach, I got the chance to actually meet John Carlos who came here to speak. Oh, okay. And, and, and I knew some of the guys that ran with him, Larry James, and like I said, my whole world would track with Rodney Bill burning and guys, that's, that's a world that I, I ran in. Uh, I, I knew those people. And John Carlos, uh, I, after that, because I knew that in the era growing up in the Mexico in the 68 Olympics with uh, Evans and those, how, how Larry James, how that was something that struck me as an athlete, how that they, they gave and paid so much as Muhammad Ali. And, you know, I'm looking at athletes now strictly, but um Having him there was a second breath of like, this is a pretty inspiring moment to meet somebody like uh, John Carlos. Pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I remember meeting Mamie. I have Isaac Harry. I remember that date. Uh, yeah. That was, yeah. That was great. <laughs> she was old. She was. She was real old. We knew that we were. <laughs> She was like maybe wife. Eisenhower, Dwight Eisenhower's wife. Yeah, right. Yeah. Younger, younger, younger. I remember meeting like Abe Lincoln. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> also, also for the younger group that, that don't know, the 68 Olympics was John Carlos and Tommy yeah. Smith when they raised their hands on the Olympics exactly. as well. So yeah. just, right, they can Google it. You can that's Google what I did. Google everything. Just to make sure. Exactly. I knew yeah. what it was, but um, Tony. How about you yes. closing things out? The anchor. Oh uh, yes. Yeah. So, oh, first I wanted to thank the members of the panel for their service in our military. That's a significant um, achievement, and it takes a lot for a man to do well in those types of environments. So I appreciate your service. I wanted to say that first and foremost. Oh, thank you. So probably my most meaningful moment at Gettysburg, I would say, would be the development of my friendship with my roommate, um, Eric White. Um, I, I listened to a speaker say in a seminar I was attending that people will always remember how you made them feel. And he, as a friend, was like, for people that I call friends, even after I left Gettysburg, I always compare them to the relationship that I had with him on campus. I mean, it was absolutely great. Um, he and I still keep in touch today. We call each other on birthdays and holidays. Um, he lives in Texas, so he's starting to thaw out just like the rest of the state is. But that's probably one of the things that I took from Gettysburg going forward and what means the most to me, because um, like I said, his friendship was immeasurable. He helped me through any difficult times. He helped me enjoy good times to the fullest. And like I said, he's somebody that, you know, I compare anybody I call a friend to. So I would take that with me. Special. 
Oh my goodness. I didn't say Ramona. She's going to kill me. And I think she's on this call. Yeah, you're in trouble. <laughs> I know. You're in trouble. She's my, she's my BFF. <laughs> yeah, my no doubt. My friend died for 35 yeah. years. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't think there are any more questions out there. Uh, the alumni we have here, do you have any parting thoughts or questions for our student athletes before we call it a night? I just want to thank you for having this and for inviting me. Yeah, it was, it was our pleasure. I think we've had a lot of fun pu pulling this together and, and connecting the dots. Um, you know, Devin and I have kind of gone back and forth and just the history that we've uncovered and being able to talk about that and then being able to make plans for the future too. That's, that's what we're doing. That's why we're doing this. That's why we're continuing to make plans, you know, just to make Gettysburg, you know, the greatest place, continuing to build it. It was yeah. great in so many ways when you guys were here and we're continuing to build that towards greater ends. Yeah. I just want to say one thing, just bring it back to what Perry said earlier is, you know, when you think about diversity, just make sure you're you're keeping yourself open to uh, people's differences, and um, you need to have empathy. Uh, if you may not necessarily understand what someone's going through, but you need to be aware and sensitive of all different cultures, sexualities. Um, that's the only way we're going to have you know a better place. You know, for me, for my children. And for you guys, eventually, for your future and for your children. So, um, thank you for for having this. Um, keep open lines of communications. Corey has my information. You know, I'm very much involved, like I said, with my hiring and talent acquisition team at my company. And I love to see Gettysburg alum, you know, on my roster. I have three of them that I got that work at Pandora, which I'm excited about. And, you know, would love to see that grow in the future. And please pass on my information. I would love to continue to communicate with the panel. And it's just good to see everyone um, yes, it is. doing well. It, it's, it's just really, really good. You know, I can't believe you and Michael both ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, enjoy your, uh, your years, uh, undergraduates. Uh, work hard and uh, things will work around. It's been a tough year for you. Things will get better. That's awesome. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. I think we had a great conversation. I especially want to thank the alumni for taking the time to talk to everybody. I want to thank student athletes for taking the time away from academics to and athletics to come enjoy this conversation. I hope you learned everything. And now you need to go study and prep for practice tomorrow. Um, I want to thank the coaches and the I committee too, as well, for helping to pull this together too. So hopefully this is just the start of events like this. We can continue to promote social issues, talk about social reform, and also just bring back our alumni to talk and hear these great stories. So again, I want to thank everybody and have a great night and stay safe out there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank you so Corey. Much. Thank you.